very good evening to everyone present here. My name is Avitoli. I, on behalf of the Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi, welcome each one of you to this book discussion event. And we are very happy to host the book discussion on the recently released book of Dr. Ganato Chokfi. In fact, Ganato is an alumnus of the department and we feel really proud of his publication achievements at such young age. In the present times when the scholars and when the young teachers are pressed, are hard pressed against the wall to either publish or perish, the publications in H index journals and approved journals take precedence of a publication of book. The PhD thesis, a result of years of toil and sweat, gets extracted bits and pieces for different journals. So what lies at the end is just a skeleton whose flesh has been devoured by the quantitative requirement of the system. And the lead professor Vinay Kumar Shivastav, who happened to be, who happened to supervise Dr. Ganato PhD thesis, used to say that every research scholar needs to at least publish one book. Now it is with his encouragement, Ganato's first book on construction of divinity was based on his PhD thesis, and that was also published by the Routledge. It was a few years back. And today we are gathered here to discuss his second book, which was published by the Pamnan Black, the distributor for South Asia, and the State University of New York Press will be distributing for Europe and United States. Now, when it comes to contemporary tribal situation in India, the late Professor Shivastav wrote in his last edited book, that was India's Tribes Unfolding Realities, which was published after his demise. He, he died last year in December. And he wrote, uh, Professor Shivastav wrote that every tribal community now awaits an, an equalitarian treatment from the state. Episodes from the past, narratives of exploitation and the diminution of the state of the people carried over generations, fill them with um, anger and remorse. And he said that it is not an exaggeration to say that in many part of tribal India, monographs written by colonial scholars on local people, which at that time were regarded as authentic, are today being read by English educated tribal people. And people are filled with loathing on discovering that they were wrongly portrayed and their culturally sanctioned was a matter of entertainment for Western readers. He also mentioned in his last book that many scholars from Northeast, they wanted to study social anthropology so that they could research their own community and produce factual ethnographic accounts that would lay to rest misconceptions about them that were in vogue because of colonial ethnographies, most of which were uncritically perpetuated by the readers. And I remember a few years back when Ganato was still doing PhD, he invited his supervisor, the late Professor Shivastav, to one of the Naga festivals in Delhi. So the late professor came, he observed, he interacted with all of us. Years later, when and Naga group celebrated its Silver Jubilee. Uh, you know, we gifted him a souvenir. We gifted the lead uh, let professor with a souvenir magazine, oblivious to the fact that the lead professor will be using these instances in his last edited book. Uh, in the introduction of his book, India's Tribes, he wrote that students from each tribal communities of the Northeast studying in Delhi have founded their own associations, respective associations during the festivals that the community celebrate back home which are linked to annual functions they conduct in delhi the student members they come in the traditional attires participate in their local sports make speeches peppered with words of wisdom um, in their own language and sometimes on these occasions a souvenir comprising of information you know, on the history and culture of the community is also released Interestingly, some of these engaged, some of those students who are engaged in carrying out these activities, according to Professor uh, Shivasta, he said that mm, they create tribalism in an urban metropolis, but these are the students who aspire to be civil servants, university teachers, bankers, entrepreneurs, and so on. And he concluded that this is the reality of the contemporary tribal world in India. And against the milieu of present day reality, the anthropological concept of tribe appears to be infructuous and wanting. 
So perhaps the need to relook into the concept of tribe and how it has been deliberated over decades may find its place in the next book project, which Kanato has started working on, I believe. And I have a feeling that Kanato will take over from where his lead supervisor left as far as the tribal question in India is concerned. On this note, I would like to acknowledge the teachers in the university because they took a chance with students who wish to turn anthropological lens not on the conventional others, but self. And today, if we are gathered here to discuss a book written by an autoethnographer, or she was the sir will fondly call it as native ethnographer, it is because there were teachers in the universities who felt the need of different narratives. So I, on behalf of the Department of Anthropology, uh, welcome all of you to this book discussion event, and I'm sure it is going to be really engaging. And um, we are very happy to have uh, Professor P.C. Joshi, the present Vice Chancellor of University of Delhi, gracing this book discussion event. Um, sir, before I invite you to say a few words, um, I, I really want the audience to, to know this, that when I, when I talk about the few teachers who, who took a chance with students belonging to different communities with different identities and allowing them, allowing us to turn the lens to ourselves and create the platform for us to tell our stories. Professor P.C. Joshi is also one of them. Sir, I invite you to say a few words. Well, I think it's a great occasion, occasion great occasion because Kanada Chopi is, uh, has written a book and Kanada Chopi has been a very silent but a very dedicated anthropologist of our department in Northeast. Now, he has been writing, I think, one of his papers appeared in Economic and Political Weekly, if I'm not mistaken. So he's been continuously working. I didn't get a chance to uh, read the book that he has written, but I, I, uh, I would definitely like him to progress. And I think uh, he's one of the rare scholars who has a very good anthropological insight into various complex topics which are uh, prevailing in Northeast today. And I think uh, he is somebody who has a good knack for the policy related suggestions also. And we definitely need anthropologists who can cut across and communicate with non-anthropologists. We definitely need such anthropologists. We desperately need such anthropologists who can go beyond anthropology, beyond the confines of anthropology and communicate to others. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, fog around understanding Northeast. In Delhi, you know how do general people behave. Of course, things are improving. And if Avitoli, Avitoli would actually confirm, I had uh, in my office called all the students coming from different states of Northeast and I had a good dialogue with them and I wanted to know, you know, what are the problems because there are, there are interpersonal, uh, you know, relationship related problems that they face. They face sometimes, of course, it's very unfortunate some kind of a racial discrimination. I don't want, I don't like this word, but I think I might like to use this word to some extent sometimes, which actually is, I think, which is improving, which requires, at least in, in, in the mega cities like Delhi, in Bangalore, and other, uh, in Chennai, I think cons constant, uh, constant education of the main population or mainstream population is required. There also we need, uh, we need anthropologically informed insight. So therefore, I think whatever is being uh, brought out by Kanata Chopi or by Avitoli Srimo is very, very important, very, very relevant for not only for Northeast, but also for others, others at large, for people in Delhi, for people in Mumbai, for people in in, in Bangalore. So with these words, I would only like to congratulate him. I would only like to congratulate all the scholars, uh, emerging scholars coming from Northeast. Uh, much has changed and I think a very distinctive kind of scholarship is emerging from Northeast and we all welcome them. So with these words, I again would like to 
I'm grateful to Vitoli and others that they gave me a chance to be part of this, this celebration. Thank you. Sir, uh, thank you so much for uh, finding time to join us on, on this virtual book discussion. And um, sir, your constant encouragement and support, we, shall, we will never forget. Now, I think we, I will hand over the next one hour to our moderator, Dr. Chakravati Mahajan. Dr. Chakravati Mahajan, he is one of the youngest um, uh, faculty members in the Department of Anthropology, University of Delhi. He's, um, he's very well read and he seems to know a lot of people because he has taught almost uh, in many universities in India, in fact, before he joined, uh, before he joined University of Delhi. So he will be moderating. So, Dr. Mahajan, uh, the virtual dais is over to you now. Thank you, Avi. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, we have gathered here to celebrate Kanato's work, and uh, this work is very important. Uh, Avitoli has already talked about how, you know, um, in the department, there's this culture of encouragement and uh, people uh, in the department, they are really supportive of the young scholars. And uh, uh, Kanato's uh, uh, experience, Kanato's academic journey has been an example. So um, this book is uh, his second book. The title of the book is Christianity and Politics in Tribal India, Baptist Missionaries and Naga Nationalism. And this uh, uh, book is a uh, history ethno-historical uh, study of the Nagas, uh, conjuries of tribes inhabiting the Indo-Myanmar frontier. This book presents a kaleidoscopic view of an unusually interesting region of India, which is uh, too often seen as peripheral. Kanato provides a distinct vantage point for an understanding of the Nagas in relation to colonialism, missionary encounters, identity politics, and cultural change, all seamlessly woven around American Baptist mission history in the region. The book also analyzes India's cacophonous post-independence democracy in order to delineate multi-faith issues, multiculturalism, and ethnicity-based movements. Within the West, episodic memories of the Great Awakening, a significant landmark in the history of Protestantism, have faded into archival records. But among the Nagas of the Indo-Myanmar highlands, Baptist Christianity persists as the dominant religion influencing their daily faith. Missionary zeal, ethnic identities, political struggle, and complex culture wars. This book is an original and major intervention on how Protestant missionary missions changed the history and destiny of a tribal community in one of the unlikeliest regions of South Asia. Kanato, as Avi has already told you, is an alumnus of the Department of Anthropology. He's currently the postdoctoral fellow at the Center of Excellence, Center of North, Northeast India Studies at Utkal University, Bhuvneshwar, Odisha. His research interests center on the ethno history of Northeast India, comparative religion, tribes and indigenous people, traditional knowledge systems and anthropology of public policy. He has already authored a book uh, which is based on his PhD thesis, Constructing the Divine Religion and Worldview of a Naga Tribe in Northeast India, which was published by Manohar and later by Rutledge in 2019. This book, the current book, is published in India by Permanent Black and uh, its uh, US and uh, uh, Europe rights are with uh, State University of New York Press. He's also editing another book, which is on cultural heritage of Nagaland, which will again be published by Manohar. I welcome uh, Kanato and uh, 
to other accomplished panelists who are with us uh, today. Uh, Rukun Adwani, who's the editor of Permanent Black, uh, he uh, has done his uh, PhD in English literature from Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Uh, apart from being an editor, uh, of, I think one of the finest editors of this generation, uh, uh, he's a novelist and author. He has uh, authored, uh, uh, you know, two very interesting novels, and he has authored a book. Uh, so, uh, and uh, along with uh, Rukun, we have um, a very, very important scholar of Northeast, who's also the director of Highland Institute at Kohima, uh, Michael uh, Henais. Uh, he's now a professor of uh, religious studies at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Um, he has conducted anthropological research in the Andes of South America and in the Eastern Himalayas. His, uh, for his PhD, um, he was at Edinburgh University and he explored the relationship between dreams sacred landscapes and personhood among the Nagas in India. And he's recently, uh, uh, in 2019, he published his uh, book, Agency and Knowledge in Northeast India, The Life and Landscape, Landscapes of Dreams. He's currently co-editing uh, two journals, um, uh, Himalaya and The Highlander. So I welcome the panel. Um, the order of the panel today uh, is uh, Rukun will uh, 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 comment on the book. After that, uh, Michael and uh, Kanato will respond to, uh, uh, to their uh, ideas. He'll say something about his book. And then uh, um, uh, the format of the discussion is that, um, that we, we will invite questions for Q&A and you can type your questions in the chat box. Um, now I invite Rukun for, uh, for his intervention. Well, first, uh, I'd like to say that I know very little anthropology. I'm not an anthropologist. I've read a little bit. I'm going to speak very briefly. Uh, most of my life is with my mouth shut. And I think this is about the first time I'm on Zoom. Uh, I'm, I'm here because of Kanato. <clears throat> I'd like to really congratulate him for a magnificent book. Um, I wasn't very keen to publish it initially. I, there's a friend um, whom you probably all know. Ram Guha, he emailed me about two years ago saying that I had published his first book called uh, The Unquiet Woods. And he said that when you publish that, mm, um, you thought it was very good, but I can assure you that this one is, is better. And it's from a region that we really need to know more about because we know so little about it. I was skeptical at first because an anthropological history centered in Nagaland sounded to me quite remote and possibly difficult to sell. And a publisher has to think about the potential sales first. However, my father used to be a bookseller in Lucknow who used to sell a lot of anthropology. And uh, I remember browsing through the ethnographies of uh, you know, the Angami Naga and the Sema Naga by J. H. Hutton. And, and um, there was Pura Hemendorf. And of course, later on in the 60s, just after he died, Elvin's autobiography, Tribal World, came and it was a very literary work. So that was also something I knew about. From the world outside anthropology, it seems to me that there are anthropologists like Hutton and Hemondorf who are parachuted in and they study a peculiar and distinctive tribe from their own frame frameworks, which are you know, Western. And they write about the customs and the habits and the behavior and so on from an external perspective. Then there are those who go not native like uh, Elwin, who really fell in love with the place genuinely, married tribals reproduced here, and uh, understood people in a sense from 
I would have tried to from their own perspectives. And from my limited perspective, you have now a third kind of anthropologist who is, in a sense, he is the field himself. Donato is, uh, I, I heard him described as uh, auto anthropologist, I think, or some such thing, which probably means that he's part of the field. And I think what is really distinctive, what occurred to me as being really distinctive about his book is the fact that it is not an observation of tribals from some external perspective. It, this is an exploration of his own heart in a sense, his family, his friends, people he knows, and people who he speaks of as my people are the subject of this book. And he himself is a subject of this book. And I read it really as a kind of something between an anthropological account and a memoir and a history. It really does seem to me to straddle a lot of fields. The other thing that I would say is distinctive about the book, at least for me, is the fact that it is a deeply compassionate and very, very involved kind of history and ethnography. It is not uh, looking at, any, uh, at these people as, uh, you know, some, some, somebody, uh, as, as uh, people who are external to him, but they are people with whom he has shared emotions. In that sense, I find this a very deeply moving kind of book. It's a very compassionate book. I connected also to Christianity in, in the real sense. It's, it's compassionate in that sense. It speaks of people that he has shared his emotions with. In that sense, I see it as sharing some of the aspects of a literary work. It's also uh, literary in the sense that Kanato, unlike a lot of anthropologists, is interested in expressing himself exceptionally well. His hold over the English language is excellent. He's very receptive to suggestions. And in the course of our interaction, uh, I felt something that I have felt about his book. That is, that this is a man who can make deeply emotional, personal connections with whoever he's dealing with. He has interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. It's evident in the book that that is a very unusual kind of uh, uh, anthropology. I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, other kinds of anthropologists also do this uh, interviewing of hundreds of people, but to reproduce their voices uh, in this very understanding and deeply felt way is something that I found extremely unusual. I also felt, if, if I'm not going on too long, I also felt that this is a script that needs to be, or a book that needs to be read, not just by Nagas and people in, in the Northeast. It is, I think, and I'm very glad to have published it because I think it is important that people in the mainland, people like me, read this account of Naga nationalism because this is the kind of nationalism that is being systematically subordinated and subordinized by the mainland. This book is admirable, in my view, not only as historical or social anthropology, but because it is deeply felt as a book about the Naga, about the Nagas, about Naga resistance and Naga resilience in the face of a suffering that has been more long drawn and more intense than anything experienced in mainland India. The bit about in the big book itself that moved me most deeply, I'm just giving you a personal account, the book, the part that, le that really, you know, got to my bones was Kanato's description of the death of T. Sakri. T. Sakri's death, in fact, a, a short account of his life. It, uh, it, it, the, the book is replete with accounts of lots of characters that I knew absolutely nothing about. I mean, I knew I knew nothing about Jagannath. I knew nothing about, or very little about Rani Gadindu. I knew absolutely nothing about Sakri. And Kanato's description of 
Sakri is really something that touched me very, very deeply. I would just like to read a little bit where it says, Sakri did not have high academic, this is on page 351. He did not have high academic accomplishments, but he had established himself as an intellectual powerhouse among those who knew him, and many considered him more eloquent, engrossing, and charismatic than his relative A.Z. Fizo. Colezo Shes, an educationist from Fizo's clan, whose father was a close friend of Sakri, recalled that Sakri was a progressive and easygoing man. He was one of the first men in Kohima town to roam hand in hand with his girlfriend. It was a rare sight those days, and in a context where the new faith was inculcating sobriety in conduct between the sexes, many may have looked askance at Sakri. But modernity was creeping into the sleepy little town of Kohima, and young men like Sakri were its embodiments. For the first time, young people like Sakri behaved like foreigners, like white people, and copied their lifestyle, Kolezo said, with a smile, implying what we both understood. The, I, I mean, if you unpack these lines, there is so much going on there. There's not just anthropology, but there is this arrival of modernity and how it has changed people. He then goes on to talk about how Sakri was deeply musical. It struck me that this person who was very interested in classical music and also very, very accomplished as a player of music and who was then the victim of internecine warfare and was assassinated and killed by the Nagas. It, it really spoke to me in, a, in, in the way that the best fiction speaks to me. I do not mean that this book is fiction at all, if I, very far from it, but it has some of the things of some of the virtues of great fiction. It, it shows you what is going on in the hearts of the people that it is writing about. And all I can say is that anytime Kanato wants to publish any other book, I'll be very happy to do it again. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, putting things in perspective, Rukun. Uh, in fact, your uh, last comment made me, uh, you know, go back to your another book which you published, uh, uh, Fiction as History by Vasudha Dalmia. I, re I recently reviewed it for Pacific Affairs and in one of the chapters, uh, the one on Lahore where uh, she talks about uh, Yashpal's Chuta Sach, even in that uh, particular section, uh, how modernity arrived in Lahore's, uh, uh, you know, the university area and the civil lines when people started meeting in those open spaces, these girls and boys from the old town of Lahore. Um, I think uh, I felt a similar kind of narrative uh, in Kanato's uh, uh, book. So I think uh, that's a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, that's how, you know, we can connect to, uh, to so much literature, uh, which was uh, written in different parts of the world uh, during that uh, period. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that, you know, you're doing such wonderful work by bringing uh, these, uh, this literature, bringing in such important uh, work um, to the light. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Rukun, for your, uh, your um, interjection. Now I invite uh, uh, Michael uh, for, for his uh, talk. Michael, please. Okay, um, well, it's an honor to be, to be invited by the Department of Anthropology at Delhi University. Um, and uh, I see many familiar faces and I, I got a bit nervous when I saw the, the count of how many people have actually joined. Uh, we have 217 people. Um, well, <clears throat> Dr. Chopi, Chofi requested that I specifically not speak about his book, uh, which, uh, and that I speak about my experiences uh, working in the Naga areas, uh, which of course opens me up to all kinds of <laughs> uh, potential critique. And um, I have an audience right now who is who's very, very familiar with the context uh, that I'll describe now. Um, but perhaps a few observations, uh, particularly for students or scholars interested in this region. Um, 
recently I was lis listening to a recent um, new books in anthropology podcast uh, with Dr. Nayanika Matur, who incidentally is a Delhi University alum herself and now associate professor, I believe, at Oxford. She did a, a postdoc at Edinburgh when I was a PhD student, so we knew each other back then. And she describes why, have, having started in political science uh, at Delhi, uh, she was drawn to social anthropology, I believe, at the Delhi School of Economics um, Sociology Department. She says, I quote, I was fascinated by the method I was learning at that point, which is basically obsessed with looking at very tiny encounters or intimate social relationships or relations and building up larger worlds from that. She says, I loved the way in which through these fine grained ethnographies, you could answer some of the big questions of the world of the time. What does it mean to be human? How does one understand power, et cetera? End quote. And I could not agree more. Um, and I think uh, I think Kanato's book I feel is a fine example of this kind of work uh, that begins in the small moments, like the one that was just described, um, and then begins to build social worlds uh, based on those small, intimate encounters and moments. In the open in the opening pages of the book, he introduces the reader for example, to a gathering of, of Christians at the Kohima War Cemetery. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been to the Kohima War Cemetery. And I cannot think of a better place or a place more imbued with layers of meaning uh, than this point of convergence, this sort of traffic jam space, this uh, place of encounter. And I think this gives us a, a sense of the sophistication of the book how these small encounters, these small moments uh, can build a uh, larger understanding of the larger social environment and world. In the middle of that intersection at the Kohima War Cemetery, there is a podium. It's a small traffic podium um, um, that has been there probably since I think at least the Second World War and perhaps even before that. Um, and I think even around something small like that, a small podium in the middle of the road, you can build an entire social history of, of, of the Naga, perhaps even an opera of encounters on a grand scale or an epic poem like the King Gesar of Tibet or Gilgamesh of Mesopotamia. I know that sounds bold, but let me give you a sense of what that looks like. Um, I actually retweeted on my Twitter feed um, pictures of the podium. Um, which you can look at if, if you can find my, my Twitter feed. Um, and all you have to imagine is an immortal traffic policeman or woman directing traffic uh, that has passed that intersection over the last three centuries, at least three centuries. If you've seen some of the this famous films, the Italian film Il Vigile, starring Alerto Sordi as a traffic cop who caused mayhem when his hand signals in the Piazza Venezia in Rome um, caused traffic uh, chaos, or perhaps Woody Allen's 2012 film To Rome With Love, uh, same, the same plaza in Rome um, and the same podium, traffic podium. So this, this person directing traffic. Um, just to give you a sense of the tiny space at that intersection in Kohima, um, this text, that is thick with signification, if we're to use the words of Clifford Gertz. Um, and let me give you a sense of why. At this space in this tiny little corner that connects um, the village and the town of Kohima between, is where you find uh, the meeting points of two clan wards, the, the Dikel or the Daputsamye or the Tsutunomye clan wards in, uh, of Kohima village. Um, you have the meeting, you have a meeting point between Western and Northern Angami in many ways. Um, you have the meeting point of the Maharaja Gambir Singh, who in 1833 came in along with his military to, to uh, to demonstrate to Kohima that they could no longer raid their plains in Manipur. Uh, and he left his foot imprints 
in a stone, which can still be visited at the, at the museum. Uh, British cartographers and their militias came through that point uh, and met our Angami guards. It's where the British set up their colonial administration. They used to call it Summer Hill, and they put a tennis court on that hill. Two years later, C.D. King and his wife uh, arrived and met with British Commissioner Damant, uh, who Dr. Chofi writes about in his uh, 2019 book, Constructing the Divine. Um, Dr. Chofi, he, he, uh, Kanato talks about how uh, Dr. C.D. King was, in, was interested in building a mission school. And Damant said, well, take over the whole program of British education. Of course, we know that Damant was shot when he tried to uh, approach Konama village and, and uh, that triggered the next encounter at that point at the Kohima War Cemetery, which was the Anglo-Naga War, uh, which brought, brought the British Empire up against Konama and, the, and its allies, which again were, uh, were mainly in, in, in Kohima. And we haven't even reached the 20th century yet. And the 20th century is, is in many ways a history of how those convergences occur at that, one, at that one moment, that space that divides Southeast Asia from South Asia, that place that has been contested for so long and for so many years. So that traffic police would probably also be able to write all kinds of stories and narratives about Unu, the first prime minister of Burma, meeting uh, Nehru and discussing the dividing lines between India and Myanmar, um, or would have witnessed the, the entrance of the military vehicles in 1954 when um, uh, the Indian army started to contest uh, Naga national uh, aspirations. So from small encounters, from small points, uh, you can build large social reality and so, social worlds and give them a sense of truth based in narrative. Um, my own research interest in the region began in 2002 when I visited Mokokchung and I heard people talking about their dreams. And I thought everyone is talking about their dreams. Um, this is a new thing. I had never experienced this before. And I met with my host family in Kohima, and I asked, um, um, what is this all about here in Nagaland? Everyone is talking about their dreams. And she turned to me and she said, well, dreams, and this is an in, sort of a loose quote from my memory, dreams are where we meet our ancestors, where we read the omens about the future and where we speak with the divine. I was frankly stunned at this idea. It gripped me for years and I decided I wanted to learn more, to explain more, to, uh, to explore more. So this same person I met incidentally is a great Naga writer and is my neighbor here in Tromsø, Norway, actually. Her name is Isterine Kire. Uh, many of you have, have read her books. And in the worlds that she, of course, describes in her fiction narratives, um, she helps to you know, unfold these realities uh, and these experiences in new and refreshing ways. In fact, she has, I think, a, a new book coming out that's connected to When the River Sleeps, which is one of her most more important novels that discusses many of these uh, really interesting encounters. So in my, when I began the PhD research, much like I'm sure Kanato did, um, I became a member of a small community and I began to sort of follow the routines of everyday meals and sharing and teas. And I found that tea time was, especially morning teas and afternoon teas was sort of a golden opportunity to engage in conversation. Uh, and I spent a lot of time, in fact, I was in Kohima for seven years and uh, for two years, it was sort of strictly uh, field work, but um, I spent a lot of time drinking tea with mothers, grandmothers, um, and the people who uh, were my
my neighbors in the, in the vicinity of Kohima village. And they spoke very often about their dreams, about these sort of small um, moments that they remembered, that they were able to sort of narrate. And they always narrated these dreams in relation to their own family histories. So dreams and their stories, their memories seemed to kind of come together. They were woven together um, in this sort of beautiful tapestry, uh, native tapestry that told a broader story that wasn't simply about human encounters, but also encounters with the divine, encounters with ancestors, dead relatives, with spirits and ghosts, uh, ghosts of the Japanese soldiers, of British soldiers, um, of uh, forest spirits, uh, all kinds of interesting ways in which uh, family memories, family narratives were woven in uh, using these uh, really uh, wonderful uh, images. And um, on one occasion, having tea with one of my close neighbors just below uh, Peace Camp, if you know Kohima Village, I, I was staying in Elkel. Um, and Peace Camp is, is uh, an, an area just below where I was staying, where uh, members now quite elderly of the Naga army that, that were fighting in the forests and in the hills in the 1950s and 60s, are, are still sort of waiting for the final uh, papers to be signed, um, for the final agreements to be signed and for the war and the conflict to be over. Um, but I used to be woken up by the bells that were rung at the peace camp. That it rings every hour um, and it rings you up and, it, and of course uh, it wakes you up in the, in the morning as well. Um, I sat down for tea down below in one of the, my neighbor's homes and uh, a woman who was serving me, team, she, serving me tea, she asked uh, where I was from. And I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an American researcher. I'm, I'm here doing my work. And she said, uh, where did you grow up? And I said, oh, I grew up in Latin America. My, my parents were both uh, teachers uh, and they were based in Latin America. So I grew up in, in Latin America. So she asked, well, where in Latin America? So I, I said, well, I, I, I grew up in Costa Rica and in Nicaragua in you know, small countries. She, and she interrupted me right away. It's like, oh, I know where that is. Um, and I found out that she was, um, she was a, a states person. She was part of the... Um, Looking from looking through my notes here, uh, she was the ambassador to Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama between 1979 and 1981, I believe. Um, an Amer the Indian ambassador, uh, and she was Naga, and this, of course, was a huge surprise to me. And so many of my neighbors in Kohima had the most extraordinary stories. They were the most extraordinary people. Um, and I think it was uh, certainly the highlight of my research career uh, to, spend, uh, to spend time there in, in Kohima. Another neighbor of mine just right next door to me uh, was the daughter of one of the signatories of the Simon Commission. Uh, so she had stories about meeting all of the people sort of that we read in the history books um, which, is a, which is a fascinating thing when you hear these stories from the perspective of people who are maybe playing a game of uh, tag with, with their friends while these incredible moments of history were, were occurring, um, but could, could articulate those stories uh, from a first-person perspective. Um, and just below my home, uh, where I was staying, was also the... the uh, the home built by Ashim Roy, who was a photographer for the, for the States, Statesman newspaper in Kolkata. His work was immensely important. Um, and because he, I believe he was one of the few photographers sort of documenting many of these important events such as Nehru's visit in 1953. Um, and he also wrote an interesting book on the cognac. So really, really interesting neighbors and um, 
one thing I that always struck me about Nagaland, and I'll and I'll and I'll finish up with this, is the incredible contrasts. And um, I think this is one of the things that will, will stay with anyone who spends time um, visiting, or even you know people who live there will will certainly recognize. You have, for example, the very heavy monsoon rains, and then the next half of the year is very dry. Um, you have beautiful landscapes and forests, um, and and then you have um, the road construction between Dimapur and Kohima, where they've they've just destroyed entire hillocks uh, just for this four lane highway. So you see this kind of contrast between the beauty and, and in many ways, the destruction. Um, if you drive up from Jorhat to Mokokchong and you turn around, you can see the, uh, a large part of the Ramaputra Valley. And you can sort of imagine um, the communities in those mountains looking and watching, you know, watching all of the historical events unfold uh, the Ahoms, you know, uh, that's uh, and the the in the uh, Burmese Anglo-Burmese wars. Uh, in many ways, the Nagas were sort of witnesses to a lot of the in strange activities that happened just below in the in the in the plains. And those are perspectives that I think merit listening to, the perspective from above, uh, from the mountains, from the hills. Um, Beppe Carlson, a professor of anthropology in Stockholm, he has this interesting paper titled um, Theory from the Hills, you know, understanding these histories uh, from, from a different perspective, from that perspective. Uh, and when you have a bird's eye view of all of these sort of nations, you know, converging in, in this small space. Um, if you look at the map of the world, you see that this region is sort of at the very center of Asia. It's sandwiched between these two colossal, colossal states of China and India that are vying for influence, geopolitical influence. Um, when the Imperial Army of Japan was certain, certain they would overtake India, um, they tried to come right through the Naga areas and they clashed with another empire with, and many, many uh, soldiers, British soldiers in particular claim that, you know, we probably never would have been able to sustain uh, if it hadn't been for the Naga. So you have this very interesting convergence point. So why shouldn't we have more histories, more anthropologies, uh, more social histories and more narratives written by the witnesses of these events, the people who lived through those experiences of encounter, the people who, who have inherited those narratives from, their gener from multiple generations and who are able to speak uh, new truths and give us all insights into the social realities being experienced uh, on an everyday basis. And I think uh, what Kanato, what Dr. Chopi does is, is remarkable and it's a remarkable accomplishment and is certainly um, a great achievement. And uh, I was honored to be asked to, to say a few words um, and thank you for this, for this opportunity. And uh, I'll finish up with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I think uh, uh, you took us to Kohima. In <laughs> some senses, uh, we felt that we are in Kohima. And, and uh, that beautiful description of the landscape, of the people, and, the, and your own field work, your own situation in the field, I think that also uh, gave us an idea that how Kanato might have done his field work. Although he has grown up in the same region, but then uh, that might be uh, his way of doing uh, what he has done, meeting people, mm. traveling through spaces. So uh, we are also very thankful to you because it must be middle in the night uh, in Norway. It must be around two o'clock 
and you are still with us. Um, so thank you very much. And we would uh, really like to host you for another conversation because I think your book on uh, dreams and uh, you have done some other work. So um, I will talk and we'll let you know uh, very soon. We would like to hear more from you. Now, uh, you. Uh, uh, Kanato with us, he, he's the writer of the book and he has, um, and we, we are, uh, actually um, waiting to listen to him. Kanato, please take over. Firstly, I want to thank uh, everyone present here. Uh, I think it's such an overwhelming response um, that all of you had uh, rather gathered here. Many, uh, many people might think that uh, looking at the topic of the book, uh, this would be quite another boring book, like uh, uh, quite very glad that, you know, for this past two weeks or so, I think the response that uh, I've been getting from people around the country. It's been really, really amazing. So uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for that. Yeah, so um, before I say a little bit about my book and the writing process as such, uh, I really want to thank uh, Michael and uh, Rukun. I think both of you, uh, when I personally asked you, uh, I know you were busy, but you made time. And then I think that was such a uh, Rukun gift. <laughs> thank you. I'd like. That was, uh, I'm very, very humbled uh, by uh, the kind of description that has come from a person of your caliber. So uh, thank you so much, Rukun, for that. Thank you, Michael. I think uh, your introduction, this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted you to uh, navigate us through the whole area about Northeast India and Nagaland, a little bit our history. So I think you've done a remarkable job. Thank you so much. I would really love to see you again in Kohima and uh, work together with you again, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so uh, at the outset, uh, many things about the book. It's it's a very thick book, you know, it's about uh, 400 and something pages. So it's a very thick book. It covers about 150 years of uh, history. So a lot, I've written a lot about Assam and Myanmar and a lot about the West as such. So all these uh, histories and about personalities, I think they converge on this tiny speck of a state in India known as Nagaland. So that is something that I have tried to attempt. So a lot of uh, narratives, I think, crisscrossed, and I think which is something which uh, readers are finding interesting. They say a lot of information is packed uh, in a much uh, readable fashion, yeah. So uh, I think that's a little bit about the book, yeah. But uh, I also want to like really thank uh, my alma mater, Delhi University, for uh, this, uh, such a warm reception. I, I was very, very encouraged and I was very humbled when uh, the department decided to uh, have a book discussion and uh, invite people for this year. So thank you so much. Mm, when you read the book, you know, I can't thank everyone enough. I mean, like I learned a lot from the department, uh, from Professor Dine, from Professor P.C. Joshi, or uh, some of my teachers are here, uh, you know, Professor DKB, uh, uh, and as well as no, I. I've learned a lot about, about anthropology from, you know, so I, I consider myself a social anthropologist, but a lot about anthropology I learned from uh, both the physical anthropologists as well as, um, as uh, uh, prehistoric archaeology. Uh, just a kind of a, uh, a small uh, advertisement so that you buy my book. Uh, there's a concept uh, that I have uh, dwelt at length. So in order to introduce Indo-Myanmar border, I have used a new concept called uh, Baptist Highland. So uh, this is a rather, uh, rather very interesting, and it's a model that I've used to understand the region better. So I would like you to at least buy the book and then talk about it, and I think we can have more discussion on that. Yeah. So yeah. So like I said, uh, whatever uh, the book uh, is about, I think a lot has to do with the legacy being part of the Delhi University. So. Um, uh, about the reflexivity, you know, uh, having this kind of uh, dialogic exchange with, uh, with people, immersing ourselves in a particular culture and social realities. I think these are things, uh, definitely methodologies that I have learned from the university, and I really want to acknowledge my teachers uh, past and present for uh, shaping me up, you know, and uh, for actually encouraging me to uh, reach this far. I have a long way to go, but whatever I've achieved so far is because of your, your contribution and the things that I have learned from the department. 
Yeah. Uh, also, uh, while writing this book, I think they are um, really indebted to many people. Like, like I said, I had traveled to Burma and to Arunachal, all the Naga inhabited areas, for three years. You know, writing this book. So uh, there are many people that I'm, I'm deeply indebted to in the villages, and people personally who have extended help. I think I can't mention each and every one of them, but uh, uh, there are some people like who have really closely worked with the book, with the manuscript. You know, I, I realized that uh, this is an, an uh, in encouragement to upcoming writers and anthropologists. Uh, never f think that you are a good writer because when a, when a professional editor like uh, Rivka or, you know, uh, Rukun goes through your uh, writing, you, dis you learn that you know nothing, you know. So I, I think I would really encourage upcoming writers and, and anthropologists, if you really want to do good work, get yourself in touch with, with uh, good publishing houses, with good editors. I think they would remarkably transform the book. And this, is, this book is basically a transformation of uh, people that have interacted over these years. Uh, especially I want to thank Rukun and uh, Dr. Ramachandra Guha who had like, painstakingly gone through the entire uh, book from first to last and then given his invaluable comments. Also, I want to thank uh, Rivka Israel uh, she, she was the first one who actually went through the entire manuscript and gave lots of insight. Um, Anuradha Roy, uh, uh, Rukun's wife, uh, uh, a, a very renowned novelist. I think her recent book just came out. I bought a copy. It's called The Earth Spinners. I think I would encourage you to actually buy that book. It's a, it's a remarkable work of fiction. So, uh, yeah, so Anuradha, basically, uh, we had so many photographs that we wanted to choose for the book, but she decided that this would be the, uh, this photograph of, of an old man uh, from Visema. His name is Vizo Ho, he passed away in 2016. So uh, this was actually designed by uh, Anuradha, so my thanks to them as well. Yeah, so uh, a lot, I think, they are, they are, like I said, a lot uh, is back in the book uh, about history, uh, uh, also, uh, one of the concepts, like I'm talking about, I, I'm talking about the Baptist Highland. So this is a concept that was actually ingrained in me during my, uh, you know, prehistoric archaeology study while I was uh, being taught by Professor DKB. Professor DKB told me that, you know, if you divide India diagonally, upper half is uh, wheat eaters and lower half is rice eaters, you know. So I think that was quite, uh, quite interesting uh, to see how uh, because anthropologists over the years, we have really, uh, you know, our understanding, of course, we do excellent work, but our, our writings and our, our research has become so limited. We just study, you know, do kind of a micro study and unable to make bigger connections. But I think being able to really see this uh, uh, large picture and make broader connection is something that I learned from Professor DKP. And uh, uh, this is the conversation that I was having with uh, my editor, Rukun, we could also say that anthropologists produce a lot of ethnographies. I mean, like we have written a lot of uh, good ethnographies, but uh, what he, you know, he's an outsider, let me say, a man of literature. What he told me is that what anthropologists lack is the larger narrative, you know, being able to connect things together. And I think that is something, me being part of the anthropological fraternity, uh, seeing larger pictures, seeing larger models, being able to connect in the Nagaland with larger history, with with post-independence in the air as such. I think these are things, um, these are methodologies that has to be developed. I'm sure it is being done, but uh, these things need to be developed more if our subject is to be taken seriously uh, by uh, people from other uh, disciplines as well as the larger uh, populace. Yeah, so uh, much about, uh, that is about the book. Also, one reason why I decided to, there are so many reasons, but. There are a few reasons why I decided to write this book also, why this book is important. Uh, personally, I feel is that um, for a lot, uh, uh, a long time, I think, uh, uh, you know, I belong to a tribal community, Semanagas. That's what Rukun mentioned. I, I'm a Semanaga, we call us a Suminaga. So uh, uh, when you talk about tribes or indigenous people, I think even today, you know, very sadly, anthropology suffers from this whole uh, you know, imagery of ex exoticism, you know, when we are talking about tribes and, uh, and, uh, and indigenous people, yeah. So I think in a way this book is uh, an attempt to actually decolonize anthropology as such. So I don't know, I think that's quite a very 
big remark, uh, uh, very proud remark I'm making. But yeah, I think this was a methodology that I developed that I think we have to uh, really de decolonize our subject as well in understanding uh, like various uh, communities uh, that India is. Also, uh, while writing this book, uh, I was faced with many challenges of, uh, you know, rewriting certain models or also rewriting certain terms, you know. I mean, like, uh, uh, even today, terms like naked nagas or, you know, headhunting, headhunters or things. These are like very much part of the anthropological conversation. Of course, that is our past. We can't deny that. But I think uh, anthropology has come of age. We are in 21st century. I think revisiting our models, our terms, and our you know theoretical perspective, especially for the for the Indian context, I think this has to be relooked. And in my small, limited way, I think that is what I have attempted in this book. So I'll be very happy huh, if you <laughs> buy the book and read it and give your comment as such. The other point that I want to very quickly mention is that Nagas, you know, has we have been uh, uh, have been uh, so called uh, uh, anthropology favorite of uh, anthropology favorite subject you know like the new air or azande or yanomamo i think nagas have been uh, the favorite subject of anthropologists and uh, me as an insider i think this is what dr avitoli also uh, she's a teacher in uh, delhi university and she would agree with me i think some we have nagas scholars here is that so far uh, what nagas we think or for that matter northeast india or tribes as a whole in india is that we think that still today uh, we are being uh, perceived or written about or interpreted through the what I call as the colonial gaze. It's 21st century, you know, India, we have about 75 years, but still then in in the way we describe tribes, or in the way we write about tribes, or in a conversation, even so much so that, you know, even when anthropologists make policies about tribes, I think there's still some kind of a colonial hangover. So uh, I have written a lot about my people, you know, about Nagas as such, but uh, what I have tried to do in this book, uh, the treatment that I've given in this book is to actually come out of that colonial gaze, you know. So if you read chapters on like, there's a chapter called Baptist Intellectuals, you know, J.H. Hutton is very much worshipped in, in my in my community, you know, he wrote the same Nagas, but there I have been very critical of his work and how uh, he actually had uh, interacted with Piso in London as such, you know. So, so many things about uh, Hutton and then about Damant, you know, when Damant came back to Nagaland in 1960, I was told that, uh, the, that the, there some people didn't allow him to enter because he was gone, you know, in the post-colonial period. These people were no longer powerful. They were just all, you know, if, if I may use white, all white Englishmen, you know. So these are things that I have actually mentioned in the book. So trying to come out of what, uh, as, a, as a Naga belonging to so-called an Indian tribe, uh, this whole idea of trying to actually subvert the colonial gaze is something that I have attempted in the book. So please, yeah, I would be very happy if you can just go through the chapters as such. Yeah. Mm, the other thing uh, 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 that I want to also, maybe just to make two uh, comments that I will make and then I will end is that, uh, like I said in the first, I've mentioned about how anthropologists uh, we have lost the broader connection. So. Uh, many people think like uh, Kana is in this uh, very narrow book, but it's not. You know, it's, I've written about a community, but basically this is a book about a very uh, what I call as noisy, cacophonous Indian post uh, Indian democracy in the post independence period. So I've written about a community, but through the lens of the Nagas, actually I've tried to understand these multi faith issues, a very difficult questions like you know ethnic based movement about conversion about. Uh, you know, uh, liberal democracy about tolerance and, and so many issues, uh, very thorny issues that I have actually tried to understand the, the Indian social reality through the lens of the Naga. So that is something that I, I, I attempted. A lot is mentioned about Nehru and a lot is mentioned about about the Indian policymakers, the, the larger Indian society, how this whole interaction has been taking place and how it is taking place even today. So that is something that I have attempted uh, through, throughout the chapters, actually, not just writing about the Nagas, but uh, uh, trying to understand the whole Indian, uh, you know, post-independent spirit, Indian democracy. I mean, the diversity, mind-boggling mind diversity that uh, India is. Yeah, so lastly, uh, I would uh, like to uh, just, uh, 
if you may, if I may, if you allow me, I would want to say that. You know, sometimes I used to think I, I, I'm trained as an anthropologist. This is my bread and butter. I teach anthropological theories and I teach basically, I teach basic anthropology concepts as such. But um, uh, one thing that I would want to uh, maybe not, I'm not saying everybody should do what I'm, I'm doing, but uh, being, you know, so I think for a very long time, mm, uh, it is the economist or, uh, you know, uh, people from other disciplines like uh, uh, historians or, you know, even for that matter, journalists, I think they have been authoritatively commenting about Indian social reality, about, about Indian society. Uh, I was just having a conversation with one of my friends and I said that like, book like, you know, Yuval Noah Harari's book, very famous book, uh, Sapiens should have been written by an anthropologist, you know, or there's a recent book, it's a brilliant book by Tony Joseph, um, it's, a, it's called Ancient Indians. You know, it's a whole exploration of archaeology, linguistics, and genetics, and, and, and uh, culture as such. And these are books, I think, which uh, anthropologists should think of writing, you know, if you really want to start engaging with, uh, with uh, the larger audience. And if, uh, if we want our voice to be heard, you know, uh, I think just some of us should move a little bit beyond our, our a little bit beyond our uh, this rigid uh, uh, disciplinary training and then move uh, beyond and then start engaging with the larger society. I think that is how, I think that is where the future of anthropology lies because I think the strength of uh, any discipline is this, being able to have this interdisciplinary approach. And this is basically my book is that I dwelt a lot on, on archives and on history and on sociology, and on political science and many aspects. Yeah. So uh, I think that is uh, something, uh, the strength of the book. And like I said, uh, anthropologists, we have, you know, we have very interesting insights about Indian society, about Indian culture, about political process and about, you know, ethnicity. I mean, this is our, where I think we, we are best at. So uh, my uh, book is basically, it's about uh, trying to actually, uh, you know, uh, bring our anthropological learning, our insights, and then trying to engage with the larger audience, not just a textbook or a book for the anthropologists and historians or, uh, or sociologists, but I think this book is written in a very simple English. Everybody can understand it. Uh, Though I think they have used some dense concepts, but with my limited uh, ability, I've tried to make the writing as legible and simple and easy as, as much as Sorry for that. Yeah, I'm using the mobile phone. So, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, like I said, uh, being anthropologists being able to engage with the larger audience, the larger world, the larger Indian populace, I think this should we uh, just uh, leave, uh, uh, you know, commenting about Indian society to people like Sashi Thakur and, and others. I think it's time, I think even anthropologists should start uh, having bigger picture and then write things that can be consumed by the larger audience as well. So with these few words, I want to end. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and then yeah, making this, uh, make me feel very happy and warm. And then, yeah, uh, this three years of hard work, I think it has finally paid off. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Yeah. So back to you, Dr. Mahajan. Yeah, thank you so much for the time. Yeah, thank you very much, Kanato. I think that was very, very inspiring. <laughs> so, um, uh, see, um, uh, uh, nobody has asked questions. Uh, 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 I think uh, people may have certain questions for Kanato. Uh, uh, those who are in the audience, please uh, do uh, feel free to ask questions. But before I take uh, uh, other questions, I just, uh, because uh, Kanato has been talking about this issue of, of you know, uh, writing for a larger audience. So I think the, the first question I want to ask uh, to Kanato is that, you know, uh, I mean, I remember when I joined the department in 2013, you used to work in Central Science Library on the first floor. And I used to visit there uh, quite often. And, uh, 
And uh, since then, you've been, uh, you know, working on your writing. So uh, there has been a transition. So I remember, uh, you know, you wrote uh, articles in the Journal of Anthropological Survey of India. Later, you uh, published in EPW. Uh, you also uh, published your uh, book, uh, which was based on your PhD thesis uh, with Manohar. And now this uh, big break from Permanent Black. Uh, so uh, my question to you is, if you can just, because uh, uh, today most of our uh, audience uh, is 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 uh, you know young people who are also aspiring to be writers like you. If you can reflect on your own journey of this this these last eight eight nine years and how you have how you have taken us you know I mean this how you reflect on this journey. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> a lot of things to say, but um, I think, Dr. Bhajit, I think you have rightly put, like, most of my time was spent in the library reading and then uh, writing. So uh, I'm always reminded of what G.B. Shaw said, that he actually said that he, uh, it took him 15 years how to learn writing, you know. I mean, for me, I'm a, I mean, like, if I may say very frankly, I'm a try, uh, I mean, from unknown part of India, small corner India, which nobody knows, uh, but being able to come to Delhi. And I think it, it takes a lot of dedication and hard work. English is not my first language. This is not my mother tongue. But I think being able to write uh, like this is, I think writing comes with a lot of practice and uh, not just writing, but even being able to uh, think creatively or I think as anthropologists, we have to think theoretically also. I think. This takes a lot of dedication, a lot of reading. The problem with uh, you know me being part of this uh, this uh, tribe called anthropologists, I think we have stopped reading. You know? So I think reading really why uh, you know immersing ourselves in the subject uh, as well as I think learning how to write. I really want to tell uh, young scholars, upcoming scholars, is that uh, writers are not born. <laughs> I've learned that you know writers are not born. I think writers are made. And uh, for me, uh, it, it, just to come up with this book and, and being able to work with rough shoulders with people like Ram Guha and uh, Rukun, it, it took me about uh, more than 11, 12 years, you know, of hard work and dedication. Yeah. So uh, don't give up. Uh, I think anthropology is a very fascinating subject. I, you know, if you read uh, this, uh, uh, let me just uh, talk a little bit you know, better about the discipline. If you see this book, the uh, ethnography has been really, really helpful for me. I don't think I would have been able to, you know, write very creatively, write in a more literary sense, being able to have the punch with uh, Rukun Sen if it was not my training in ethnography. So I think we have to really take our methodology and our subjects very seriously, not just, you know, to write something uh, about a subject, but if you really want to connect with the audience, I think ethnography the art of writing, you know, which Professor Shivasta always used to tell me. He said that ethnography is learning the art of writing. So I think this would be very helpful for uh, the upcoming scholars. Yeah. So I, did I answer your question, Dr. Mahajan? Yeah. yeah, I think you answered my question as well as Kamal's question. Because oh, okay. Kamal is a, is a PhD scholar uh, in the department and he has started his work in a Zeme Naga village in Manipur. So uh, he was uh, basically he was trying to ask you about his outsider position and how he can uh, maybe you, you can reflect a bit about that. Also, the second uh, question is by Vibha Joshi. And uh, Vibha uh, is obviously talking about, you know, she has not read the book, but then uh, the scroll piece and, uh, and the idea of uh, constitutional Indians. So I think these are two questions which you can, I mean, these are not questions, but you have to comment on uh, these two uh, ideas. So Kamal's uh, outsider position and uh, uh, Vibha Joshi's question about uh, constitutional Indians, uh, the term which you have coined. Yeah. 
So I think uh, regarding the outsider's person, see, um, let me just be uh, very honest here. I have dwelt at length about the Kachins and the Karens and the Chins uh, in my book, you know. So uh, uh, these are like, we, people say that we look similar and we occupy the same geopolitic, geopolitical space that is uh, the Indo-Myanmar frontier. But uh, I think I was completely an outsider there, you know, especially when I went visiting some of the places there, language was completely uh, very different and like uh, it was, uh, I totally, I could not, it was like almost like German or, <laughs> or you know, Japanese to me, the language, the Kachin speak or the Chin speak. So, but uh, what I think I have developed uh, in my research with them is, um, uh, with, with, I think we take participant observation very lightly. So I think with what I call it something that I learned crossing the border is that um, that uh, uh, what I call it is empathy, you know. So I like totally I didn't understand the language, but I was able to actually connect the dots, you know. They they are they are English speakers. These are also like most of them have become uh, Baptists, you know. So they speak good English, but in villages and all, I was able to actually because perhaps because of my years of uh, training in anthropology, able to, you know, empathize and then understand their gesture and their, you know, innuendos and things like that. So I think uh, a lot of uh, being an outsider just doesn't mean going and then, you know, listening to people and then writing about but living with them and then being uh, far more empathic to, to their voices and things. I think it comes with a lot, of, a lot of time. So for me, like, I didn't have time to learn the language. It would have taken me years and years to come on the language yeah. But uh, uh, I have to be very honest, we learn so many methodologies and uh, methods in, 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 in our classrooms, but uh, I have to be honest that we, you know, when you actually plunge ourselves into the field, we have to develop our own strategies. Of course, the, the things, you know, what we learn in classroom comes handy about interviews or, you know, simple basic about, about uh, methods and, you know, things we learn about reflexivity as such. But I think uh, you really get to know, you have to navigate yourself once you plunge into the field. Yeah. So as, as an outsider, I don't think there's hard and fast rule how you follow or what you have to do to write uh, an excellent thesis or come up with an excellent book. I think it's all about navigating the field, navigating people, navigating cultures, and everybody's unique. You know, I'm sure Kamal, uh, the, the, my friend Kamal, who's asking question, is unique in himself. He belongs to a certain community of faith. He belongs to a certain family, certain community, or you know, certain economic background. I'm sure all this is actually reflected in when we write. You know, so what Rukun exactly said is true. You know, like when you read my book, this is all reflected. My identity, my Baptist identity, my you know. I mean, that times one of my friends said, there's kind of sometimes you know, some of the language you have used seems to be a little bit patriarchal." You know? using terms like tribesmen or things like that. So I think our gender, our identity, the community we belong to or, or uh, the religion that we belong to, this all gets reflected in the text while writing ethnography. But uh, the best thing about it is that we can use this to our advantage, you know? And then uh, I think that is something I, every anthropologist should learn how to navigate, and how to work out that process, yeah. So I think that much for, um, the outsider perspective. Uh, actually, <laughs> I, I didn't, mm, this whole uh, idea of uh, constitutional Indians, uh, this has actually steered, uh, it's okay, it's, I'm happy that people across, at least uh, a large section of uh, the intellectuals and people across the country are talking about this and discussing, but uh, I also put myself in a very precarious position because I knew that, you know, this would have, ruffled feathers from both uh, the Nagas as well as a certain section of the polit political spectrum in the mainland, yeah. So um, you have to know that uh, throughout the book I have mentioned, you know, uh, Naga nationalism has, you know, we have gone through 70 years and still today it's just, we just can't proceed, you know. And one of the main reasons why Naga political issue can't be solved, why we can't move forward is the idea of constitution. So whether it is Piso, whether it is my grandpa, or I have relatives who are still fighting for so-called, you know, uh, Naga independence, such, even for them till today, this idea of constitution is very, very difficult and very thorny. So for Nagas, it's like whether the political solution should be outside uh, 
outside uh, the Indian constitution or within the Indian constitution. I think that is a problem. But for me, when I wrote this whole idea of constitution Indians is that I, of course, I, I, I'm an Aga, I, I belong to a certain ethnic community, but uh, I came up with this concept more, uh, I think for, uh, I don't know whether others would agree with me or not, but for the Lechas, for the Bhutias, for the Adis, for the Abizos, everybody, you know, because I think uh, whether we like it or not, Northeast India is so very crucial and we are sandwiched between two large emerging giants and all civilization. So until and unless we find a foothold for ourselves, we are going to be swallowed up. I mean, that's, that's the reality, whether it is culture, language, or our identity or politics, you know. So we felt, I think the best way for a so-called minority like me to argue or to have foothold, see eye to eye, you know, uh, with uh, maybe a learned uh, Brahmin from Banaras is the constitution, the idea of constitution. You know, I, I, people can say that we are, you know, outside <laughs> the Varna fall, but being able to see uh, learned Brahmins from Banaras, eye to eye is the idea of constitution. So this is something that I have developed upon. Not many people are happy, I, but I'm also very glad because uh, it's making a lot of young people in office I think, yeah. So like I said, this is a, uh, an idea I want to put into a book, hopefully, if time permits, because this is so crucial. I love my country. India is a fascinating country, you know, and uh, I mean, like, it just the, the kind of cultures and traditions that uh, India is, it's so much overwhelming, it fascinates me. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely uh, write more about this idea of constitution in Indians. But like I said, the whole idea of coming up with this concept is not as a Sumi Naga or a Naga, but I think this is something that I, maybe I thought even the Dalits or, you know, if you allow me, subaltern groups or even the Adivasis of Central India perhaps can use this model to, our, to talk about the rights and dignity. And India's constitution is so fascinating. It's remarkable. And I feel like we should, uh, you know, the, keep protecting the secular nature of our constitution with our, with our you know, with our life itself, yeah. So this basically, that is one of the reasons why I decided to write a short piece about the idea of constitution in Indians, which I briefly touched about in the conclusion of my book. So when you read the book, there are a few lines that are dedicated to this whole idea of a constitution in Indians. Yeah. So maybe we can have more conversation, I think as anthropologists, yeah. more conversation about constitution in coming days. Yeah. I think, uh, 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 Kanato, there are many congratulatory messages from very important people. Also, Thank you. Mm. Uh, uh, there are questions, others, is, uh, uh, but I'll ask only one now because you've partially uh, answered two of the questions which are there on in the chat box, Vizukhole, Lutez, uh, and uh, also I think Samuel's question, you've touched a bit, but uh, Sarveshwar Sahu, uh, I think he's a professor at uh, IIT Delhi, he's asked, uh, who are the anthropologists uh, who have influenced you the most? So I think with that question, uh, I, I, I won't be able to take any more questions. It's already 6.30, uh, but please answer that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, uh, there are so many, you know, like so many, but uh, I was like blown away when I read The New Air by Evan Richard, you know, the use of language, his interpretation. So much so that we think that the whole uh, interpretive school dates back to, you know, Evans Pritchard. So I think Evans Pritchard, I mean, like as a undergraduate student, when I picked his book, The New Air, I think that really, really very much uh, uh, inspired me, you know, to write creatively and then have this kind of an interpretive approach to studying societies and culture. Yeah, the other fellow that I, I keenly, uh, keenly, keenly follow is uh, uh, this, uh, most of you know this Clifford Geertz. I mean, like, uh, maybe we don't, not all of us would agree with his theories or with his concepts, but his command over English is remarkable. I mean, just you have to just read Clifford Geertz's writings, you know, uh, about anthropology, about societies, and just not being blown away, you know. So Clifford Geertz is, I think, someone that I deeply, deeply inspired, being inspired. The other uh, one scholar, uh, maybe he's an anarchist, you know, so, uh, Maybe there are many concepts that I don't totally agree with him, but uh, in terms of being able to see larger picture, make larger global interconnections, and then being able to, uh, you know, give anthropological ideas to 
the global audience is David Graeber. I mean, I would recommend every upcoming anthropologist to read his book called Debt, you know, D-E-B-T. I mean, like, that's a remarkable work of uh, economic anthropology, work about debt and finances and about markets from the perspective of anthropology. So David Graeber, yes, definitely David Graeber has been a huge influence uh, uh, in actually making me see broader interconnections. But there's one, uh, one uh, um, professor that I would like to just uh, mention. Uh, he, uh, he taught me just for one year, but uh, being able to you know, uh, see in terms of models, I just talked about Iravati's Car uh, Carvis, uh, concept about in the, dividing India diagonally or uh, being able to come up with concepts like, uh, you know, uh, Baptist Highland, which is the, I think it's the Baptist Highland is the, is the second chapter of the book. I want really uh, want all of you to read that if you want to have a better grasp of the Indo Myanmar border. So I think being able to think in terms of models uh, owes a lot to the late uh, Professor DKB Bhattacharya. Yeah, and of course, Professor Shivasta, very much, he, he's the one who has inspired me to write uh, creatively and then uh, explore more possibilities. On and on I can go, but I think people are getting late. So <laughs> let me just end here. Yeah, so thank I you so much, Dr. Yeah. Mahajan. Yeah, wonderful, Kanato. I think um, thank you very much for uh, this discussion, Kanato, Rukun, Michael. It's been a wonderful, wonderful panel, and I thank you all. Uh, over to you, Avi. Uh, I think we, we have come to the end of the book discussion event, and uh, we have uh, heard from the author himself. We have heard from the speakers. Just one chapter that really, really had me going was uh, chapter five that was exotic natives no more. And it was about the, the Konyak Naga. And he mentioned about the Ang, uh, you know, how Ang is like a specimen now. We were talking about colonial gaze, but I think now we should also be talking about tourist gaze because for the sake of the tourist appetite, how the once powerful Ang has been reduced to a specimen in his own, um, in, his ho in his own settlement. I want to thank all the well-wishers, the friends, uh, scholars, not only from DU, from JNU, from Jamia, from various central state universities ac across the country uh, and abroad. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.